thank you everybody for for signing up and for joining us today um, for our latest Sifted Talk. This Sifted Talk is in partnership with uh, Invest, Invest Lithuania and is focused on Lithuania and its rise as one of the EU's fastest growing destinations for fintech. Um, helping us to delve into this topic uh, is a stellar panel, which includes Marius Jogilas from the Bank of Lithuania, um, Natalie Ustman, for, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Curve, and Dimitri Guganava, the Vice President of Banking and Acquiring at Sama. So obviously this is a very fascinating topic. FinTech is a booming sector and Lithuania has really established itself in recent years as a go-to destination and hub for FinTech startups in Europe. Um, we want to kind of delve into how this came about and really what the country is offering and how the sector could be growing. Um, so to begin with, um, yeah, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, I will give a bit of time uh, for each uh, participant, each panelist to introduce themselves, but specifically related to Lithuania and FinTech. So to begin with, um, talking to the two startups we have here, um, can you just explain why your company, wh what the decision was, the process behind establishing operations in Lithuania. And maybe to turn to Natalie first, if that's okay. Sure, not a problem. Um, so uh, Curve, just to give a little bit of back, background in case uh, people don't know what Curve is. Um, Curve is, a, I, I wouldn't call us a startup anymore, we're a scale up, <laughs> but, you know, gaining, gaining a lot of traction and momentum um, in, based in London. Um, and we are uh, a financial super app, so it's uh, all your cards in one, where, uh, whereby uh, we are basically a platform for you to manage your fin finances. Um, so uh, Brexit was on the horizon, we knew it was on the horizon for quite a while, and we started to cast our eyes out to where we could go for our EMI license for, um, as passporting was no longer going to be available out of the UK. Um, and we were looking at a number of markets. Uh, Lithuania kind of came up uh, to the top of our list. We obviously did our analysis and, and stack ranking uh, uh, you know, of the different markets about what was available in the market and what was on offer. Um, and I just wanna talk about some of the things, some of the highlights about Lithuania and how uh, they ended up being uh, top of our list and ultimately where we've applied. Uh, first, um, uh, you know, Lithuania has been putting um, significant government effort and, you know, this comes in stimulus, but also um, uh, um, organizations like Invest Lithuania and the FinTech, I actually pretty much like the FinTech Newcomer Program, I thought that was a really good program as well. So there were these two things where uh, the government was there to help the FinTechs that were coming into the region. Um, the Bank of Lithuania is known as progressive in dealing with new entrants into the market. Uh, we had some pre-meetings with the Bank of Lithuania as we were evaluating it, and we were really happy with our interactions and continue to, to be. There's also very low corporate tax income rate, it's the third lowest in the EU. We have to think about that. Um, it's important. Um, started to look at also the, the working population. Invest Lithuania helped us to understand what the working population looks like and what other companies are there. Uh, you know, one of the things we saw was a, diver a diverse working population in terms of skill set, particularly also in, in our technical field, which was important to us. The languages and the nationalities were quite diverse. And of course, English is very good uh, amongst the Lithuanian population, which is very helpful for us. Um, and then there was also the fact that there was already a track record with fintechs. There were many fintechs that were already there. Um, and so we knew that the, um, it, it was a welcome place for fintechs. And I just would put in the last one, which is when I started to talk to people, we realized a lot of them had already invested in a crowdfunding round of Curve <laughs> and or were Curve users. 
uh, which felt very welcoming. They already knew about our company, knew about Curve, and had invested in Curve as as uh, as individuals. And you know that that was really wonderful to hear. So there was an excitement about Curve in the market. Great, thank you so much. And and turning to Dimitri, um, obviously Sum Up um, has its main office already in Berlin. So I'm curious about the decision then, because obviously you have a different decision-making process having already you know, had these operations within the EU that did not, perhaps were not so affected by, by Brexit just because you had you know, EU operations already. So, so what was the decision that you made that led to Lithuania being you know, where you went? Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question, Kit, and um, thanks for having me here today. Yeah, to sum up, maybe a quick intro as well. It's a payments company um, enabling small merchants to accept card payments um, starting from 2012. And as you said, we have um, quite wide geographical footprint, right? Also within you, but also beyond that. And we have multiple offices um, in many European countries. But I think uh, the same as, as Natalie was mentioning before, we were in the same situation, right, with the Brexit, because um, we have been operating under our UK license uh, with the passporting and also in other European countries. So we started the same journey to analyze uh, where to go. And I think, um, yeah, it's pretty much the, the same same arguments, right, but maybe I can also put this um, in, in my thoughts, right, so when, when we're talking about license and, and regulation, um, of course, it's complex topics and as we all know in startups, uh, we are always impatient and we move to, to move fast, right? And without having license, you cannot move at all, right? Let alone fast. Um, and the second argument for us, apart from license, was of course the, the access to infrastructure. And I mean here the access to the SIPA clearing systems, which I find very like a unique value proposition from the that Bank of Lithuania developed for, for fintechs. Um, and I think it's that the license can be complex, it could take a while, right? Um, and I think what we encountered in, in Lithuania is that there is an ecosystem that helps you to abstract this complexity and uh, support you throughout the process, right? In preparation and also during the, the application process, right? So, for example, um, you can get access to, to the qualified legal companies that, you know, to have right expertise, have done it and can advise you. Uh, on how to structure the application and also you have the chance to engage with the, the Bank of Lithuania also. Uh, we had um, multiple meetings and it give, gives you the feeling of um, like transparency and to get a good sense of how the progress is, is um, moving and then a good sense of when actually you could get the license and for us actually from the very beginning what we discussed in terms of time frames it was kept and gave us the, the good, good feel of certainty in the end. Um, yeah, I think there's two two components on the high level, um, the, the regulation enabling you the licensing part, which is relatively easy and transparent, and um, also the access to infrastructure, which also worth mentioning that there is another, let's say, complexity layer, right, um, to get access to infrastructure, and there's also a few companies within Lithuania who already built the ecosystem around that, enabling fintechs to also integrate faster there. So again, abstracting this complexity and uh, optimizing for speed. So I think if we put this together, um, I find it quite uh, compelling USP for, for fintechs to go through Lithuania. Great, thank you. And, and turning to Marius then, um, could you just tell us a bit about the beginning really? I mean, when did Lithuania and specifically Bank of Lithuania decide to really establish itself or try to establish the country as a fintech hub? And how difficult was it, especially at the beginning? Mm -hmm. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Kit, for this good question. I, I wouldn't put the date on that uh, because probably it was uh, not, uh, you know, uh, one day in a month that it happened. It was a gradual understanding, actually observing uh, the things happening across the EU and very specifically in Britain, uh, where the back then the administration in UK decided to put forward the FinTech manifesto as such. And we probably have been inspired by this uh, initiative uh, by the global, you know, hands down global uh, financial uh, center, uh, London, you know, embracing this uh, as one of the future initiatives. Uh, but uh, probably the most important question is why? 
uh, and the why uh, is uh, the homegrown issues that we have been trying to address as a supervisor and regulator in Lithuania. And that has been uh, a bit uh, slow moving uh, uh, financial system uh, in Lithuania and the region, which has been uh, predominantly dominated by uh, foreign banks, which uh, viewed the region uh, you know, as just a near shoring type of an activity, but would actually you know, really uh, looking at it in a kind of terms of a long-term uh, development perspective. And we wanted to push them a bit. And we have been looking for ways, uh, uh, keeping this uh, open-minded uh, setup uh, where it's not the regulator, you know, that comes with heavy uh, regulatory interventions, but to provide the market impetus uh, to, to move them forward. And uh, embracing uh, this uh, rising uh, initiative uh, which is uh, kind of combining technology with a you know, good old finance and making it faster, cheaper, and challenging established business models. Uh, that looked to us as a way to promote the development of a homegrown financial system. But we also have been very pragmatic, understanding that you know, it's very small likelihood uh, or almost negligible that BBVA or, you know, uh, Deutsche Bank will establish where retail uh, branches uh, uh, in you know small and growing uh, uh, corner of Europe. Uh, but uh, the new entrance uh, into this, uh, they might find it uh, quite a good place uh, to grow their, their business. And we leveraged this, uh, this initiative, this reason, uh, with the ability to be part of this bigger, ecosystem, which is the single capitals market and single banking union of the European Union. And that is the proposition on which we build. And the, the biggest ingredients uh, that I, I guess allowed us to succeed was actually learning from the industry itself uh, that uh, the recipe for success is the good user experience. And what are we selling, if, if I can say that, you know, we are selling public service. And if we can provide that public service in an efficient way, uh, our customers uh, will choose us. So that was the focus. Uh, and it was not a decision so solely done by a regulator. It was a, a strategy they decided at the government level that if we do that, there needs to be a across the board initiative, a, a working group established uh, uh, kind of to have a list of the things that have to be done, ranging from immigration service to kind of uh, the tax authority uh, supervisor, that if we embrace this initiative, what do we have to do to, to give it a chance? And here we are, and now we're looking back. And, and turning to you, Natalie, for a second, I mean, how important do you think it is, you know, having come from London, being in London yourself, um, as a headquarters. I mean, how important is it to have a, a flexible and, and quite innovative minded central bank and banking system in place? I mean, you have to remember that we come from in London, an innovative uh, central bank uh, and a very open economy. And that's been the success of FinTech in the UK. So clearly, uh, you know, it is one of the things I, <laughs> You know, one of the first things we did when we, we got our license is we, we needed to find a solution for um, a partnership that we were doing with, with somebody in Europe. And, you know, I, everybody was like, oh, we're asking already. <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, this is what we need to do for our business. So we do need to propose these innovative things because that's what we need to grow. That's what we're about. And we did. And we've come out with a solution. So it's all been it's all been great. But it was you know, within weeks of getting our license, we already had to ask for something innovative to be done. So yes, we we do look for innovation. We are looking for, um, a, you know, a, a central bank that is open-minded to, to a digital first economy. That's very important to us uh, because that is how our model is, is growing. We will never have a, you know, a, a curve is not a bank. Uh, we will never be a bank. We will never have bank branches. So it's 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 a very different model. 
Um, and, you know, we're, we're providing a very different solution that doesn't really exist out there. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we need that for sure. And I'm curious, obviously, you know, the fintech landscape in Lithuania has grown massively in recent years. Um, there were 55 fintech companies back in 2014. At the end of last year, there were 230 kind of registered and licensed uh, fintech companies in the country, um, which is a huge increase. And the biggest rise happened in those two years after Brexit. So I'm just wondering how we have looked at this a little bit, but how much Brexit really impacted the growth of Lithuania as a fintech hub? And I'm curious whether there are lessons that other countries, other cities could learn from what Lithuania has, has done so far. And uh, maybe Dimitri, if you have any thoughts to begin with. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's hard to really speak about the numbers, like how much of this 200 fintechs really um, ended up in Lithuania because of the Brexit. What I can say, and maybe Marius um, can also comment later, that for sure Brexit um, expedited this trend, right? Because there were UK as an established hub, um, I think has quite a few fintechs operating from the UK within the EU, and then they were forced to find alternatives. And I think Lithuania having or ended up in the right place in the right time uh, to kind of seize this opportunity as well. Um, I think that's that's for sure. And what was the second part of the question? Sorry. Um, anything that other countries or other cities could learn from Lithuania's experiences or what Lithuania does well perhaps yeah I think on, on the surface it sounds very easy right so there's a very few basic ingredients into this recipe right and Natalie and, and Marius mentioning so like in theory everybody could do that um, of course it's not that easy to implement and um, execute but I think it will be a bit hard now for others to follow and my, my thinking here is that it's kind of time is of essence right so now lithuania is a bit ahead right and like the, this regulation as an enabler was the trigger to start this um, generating the ecosystem and yeah the changes to open up maybe the regulation more it's easy but to really build this ecosystem then it's more organic and hard to replicate and i think um, lithuania is a bit ahead of building this kind of positive loop of self-reinforcing ecosystem right you attract more fintech which in its case attracts more talent, which attracts more fintech investors. And then this is kind of how, how things grow. Um, and I think it's, yeah, that, that will be hard now to just by copying the model to, to uh, achieve the same results, right? Thank you. Um, and, and I'm gonna turn to a question we have from the Bulgarian Fintech Association. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q and A and I will try to get round to all of them as we go along. Uh, so this is a question for Marius, which is, uh, did you use any European help programs or whatever outside input um, as you were developing this? Uh, great question. Uh, before I answer this question, I'll, I'll, I'll add on to what uh, Dmitry was saying. And probably I'll, I'll tell you something which I haven't uh, discussed before. Uh, we as a supervisor, we're also kind of... Um, looking for a way to uh, find the most uh, pertinent and the most uh, blocking issue for fintech sector to develop and i think we identified very early on and uh, that has been something that Mitri also mentioned uh, the inability for non-bank for non-banks uh, to plug into the financial system without actually finding a partner, which is a bank. And for us, uh, in a country where uh, the banking system has been uh, very concentrated, it was almost uh, no go. So what we did, uh, we created this uh, infrastructure solution, popularly known by the payment system uh, centrally, which unblocked this. Once we have been in the mode of implementing it, we were ourselves in the gray zone. Such a solution uh, was not introduced, was not embraced by other national central banks in the, in, the, in the euro area. 
But now you can say, uh, looking back, it was a bet that paid off because now it is an accepted way. Uh, you know, we really now understand that FinTech has a place to play. Uh, consumers love it. Uh, it's really pushing the incumbents, so great. But back then it was not sure. And internally we had very difficult uh, discussions ranging from legal ones to the kind of risk management uh, also. Uh, is it a good decision? So now looking back, we can say it was a good one, but we, you know, we really were 50-50. So I would say that was a kind of the defining moments for us. Now answering the question from Bulgarian FinTech Association, uh, as a central bank, we are not taking any public money and we are not allowed to according to the central bank uh, independence and uh, non-monetary financing. But uh, I'm sure uh, there are multiple European uh, programs uh, being utilized, uh, which are focused on talent development, uh, education programs, as well as uh, promoting uh, uh, technology sectors in Lithuania and in the region. So the short answer is uh, we don't, but I'm sure other agencies do. And, and to follow on from that, um, Marius, I'm curious, obviously, you know, now that you have this, this position as one of the kind of the leaders, you know, at the forefront of the European fintech space, um, do you get a lot of other countries coming to you? Is there a sense that it, you are, that there's dialogue either at a European level or one-on-one -on -one to, to help the rest of the continent grow? Or is it more kind of competitive? I mean, does it need to be a zero sum game with one country winning at the expense of others? Or can, you know, is there a cooperative aspect that really could push the whole continent to succeed? Sure. Let's be frank. And then we started off, uh, there was a lot of uh, denial and uh, really Lithuania. And uh, probably right so, uh, you know, we had many competitors. And at that point, uh, it was a nice, it was not a nice conversation with our counterparts, even uh, fellow regulators uh, on the panels uh, like this one, you know, we had to make our point. But uh, now, once we are past this, you know, you know, the history is behind us, you know, we say, look, you face the same issues that, as we do, you know, you have this, uh, company by the name of Facebook approaching you, you know, what did you say? Uh, we said this, and we interpret the legislation this way. What about you? Because, you know, we have to share our view because, you know, we have the same ecosystem to protect. So in that sense, uh, I believe that now we are much more plugged in, not only plugged in, we are in, in some sub areas shaping the regulatory debate in European Union. Uh, for example, crowdfunding, uh, uh, space and uh, discussions on uh, crypto assets. So that's within the area where we now, you know, have something to say. And why do we have something to say? Because we have seen it uh, firsthand. Uh, we talked to the good guys, we saw the bad guys, and now we can share. So that sharing is happening right now, and we have very good uh, dialogue uh, going with the European Commission on all their initiatives specifically on the fintech action plan so that's really you know, now we feel fully plugged in into kind of this broader policy making that uh, you know we are creating uh, jointly thank you and, and turning to dimitri and natalie for a minute obviously a key key aspect for any company is is talent um and with more fintech companies startups arriving you know they're they are often going to be presumably going after similar talent is have you found yet that the talent is the talent pool rich enough in Lithuania for what you need and I wanted to follow this quickly with a question from Ross Johnson which is uh, can you elaborate on which talent you you've recruited in Lithuania specifically what skill sets and level of experience are in abundance and what is still developing maybe to Natalie first if that's okay uh, sure so um I, I should begin by saying uh, there are some regulatory obligations that we have within the market, of course, which is expected, uh, and some positions that we have to have in place. Uh, we need to have a CEO position, so somebody to uh, head up 
our operations uh, across Europe. Um, and there are um, an M there is an MLRO for anti-money laundering, a compliance officer, and a risk officer that are focused on the, it, you know, all of the regulation having to do with being an EMI in, in Europe and making sure that we are in a compliant position. So those are um, obligations. And I would imagine with so many fintechs coming in that the, the um, competition is tough to get those um, those top people, I believe that we have. <laughs> I'm quite happy. We uh, we have been um, very picky with who we've chosen uh, to be part of the Curve team, and we're you know we we really did a thorough look. So that's been very good. Now beyond that, we have realized that there is uh, a multilingual population, which would be great for our customer experience uh, expansion. So we are we haven't we're, we've only been there since of course the uh, first of January. So now we're starting to look now that we have the we call it the founding team in place. Um, so now we're lo we're looking at whether we would extend that. Um, we think that there's a good possibility because um, the um, there is there is a savings to be made in terms of the salaries, and we now have an office space uh, in Vilnius. Uh, and we also then also realized uh, there's great engineering talent. And so that's actually, we are actively hiring for engineers. So if, uh, if anybody here knows any engineers, <laughs> we're hiring. So uh, yes, so that's, those are the two areas that we started to look at. And, you know, I think that's a springboard for looking into uh, lots of other areas uh, that we have. There's a two hour time difference between uh, uh, Lithuania and the UK, which is really good for us. Uh, so we overlap in terms of hours, so that's really easy. And as I said, the English is great. Um, so, uh, and we found a really strong cultural fit, fit uh, in terms of um, the Lithuanian um, just culture and, uh, and, and ours is very, very in sync. So it's good. And, and Dimitri, having, you know, having had your footprint there a little bit longer, um, have you found any areas that the talent is perhaps not as developed, anything that's kind of missing from the ecosystem, human capital wise? Yeah, sure. I'll start by saying that for um, like scale ups, right, as Natalie mentioned, we are also scale up currently. Um, it's yeah, one of the biggest challenges is really finding the tech talent, right, um, to support the, the growth that we are on the path of. And that's why you see recently that many um, bigger fintechs within Europe are establishing like regional hubs in many countries just because they want to tap into their local talent pool. Now, with the, with the pandemic situation, this might actually change now. Um, but let's see how this goes. But also, we are facing the same challenge of, of uh, finding the, the tech talent at scale. And of course, in, in Lithuania, actually, we said that we, we found that there is a very good um, uh, talent pool that we can tap into and already start taking like the, the hiring there. Um, but of course the market is still like the small to really uh, feel all our um, growth ambitions, right? With the talent. And um, I think so far by my observation is more local talent pool. And maybe now with this positive uh, loop, then it will attract more, more talent of outside of Lithuania then it becomes uh, already more interesting. Um, but um, as I said, there's no, gap in terms of the skill set that we are looking is just yeah the, the talent pool is not as big as we would wish for let's say for now so that's why we also have the, the multiple offices across many countries to also um, grow faster there thank you and, and turning to Marius um this is what part of a question from the q a from Atta Uzu Hana Uzu Hashan sorry if I pronounced that badly and partly my own question which is um obviously you know the, the cheaper banking license and the, the ease of getting a banking license is a big plus for Lithuania. But what else is, you know, what other advantages do your ecosystem, does your ecosystem provide? I mean, Natalie's already mentioned low taxes or, yeah. And so, but what else is really helping put you with a competitive advantage? Thank you. Uh, let me clarify what is being maybe meant by cheaper. Um, we have one regulatory standard, standard across the European Union and banking licenses are being granted by a single supervisory mechanism, which is the Eurosystem regulatory body. National NCBs are only facilitating this process. And that's where the biggest benefit is. How good you are at leading the firm through that process. 
and you know you take it to the final endpoint, which is yes or no for the banking license. And I, you know, we say uh, the banking license is being granted by European Central Bank, not Bank of Lithuania. Uh, in terms of how does that translate into costs? Well, it can take you, in some cases, two years, uh, or it can take you one year. And paying your lawyers for one year is um, much cheaper than paying your lawyers for two years. And that's uh, that's probably the biggest. Uh, and you know, you are out of uh, the market for much longer. Uh, so that that probably is uh, one of the one of the things that we are focusing on. And uh, relating to your previous discussion on talent, I can share a story uh, where. A couple of years back, uh, we had a discussion with our telecom uh, companies, uh, maybe telecom companies would be willing to enter the FinTech echo scene, and uh, they did. Uh, they formed a, a, a joint venture. All telecom companies in Lithuania formed a joint venture, and uh, they pushed for QR-based solution, uh, P2P payments. Uh, there was a startup by telecom companies, and they developed that solution uh, uh, into a product and at some point they abandoned it because they didn't see uh, kind of any traction but it was a startup uh, actually they had to get the permission from European anti-competitive body to have this uh, joint startup why I'm telling you this story and Dimitri knows uh, the people uh, behind that solution they formed a, a company and they leveraged their talent and the know-how and they developed uh, that into a Pay salute, and that pay salute is a company that was acquired by SumUp. And that, that's how the talent appears. It doesn't come from, you know, it doesn't grow on the trees. People have to be in the industry or they have to be in a closely related industry. So the belief that I share and maybe others also share is that's how uh, you develop the ecosystem. Um, Small startups, failures, successes lead into the bigger ones. Uh, people move from one company to another. They share knowledge, uh, know-how. Um, because you, you can take a developer from, um, I don't know, manufacturing industry. Uh, he will be good technically, but he will not be savvy enough to understand the, the intricacies of, um, I don't know, interconnections with uh, multiple systems and uh, reporting this, uh, that need to be done in the financial industry. So that's, that's the biggest benefit, I believe, that you know, having this small, very vibrant uh, ecosystem that grows in itself. I mean, obviously, so far we've talked about what Lithuania is doing right, but I'm curious, what could it do better? Um, maybe look, turning to the start uh, the scale-ups here um uh so where what have you found that is still lacking or you would prefer that you feel still needs to be further developed whether it's regulatory side or or some other aspect i I, I have uh, marius i hope <laughs> you don't mind but you're aware of what i i will say because it's 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 already been uh, brought up there were there were two things that we we've we've had as we've come on board, I, I mean, I think the, third, the first is um, we do have to, a lot of documents that we need to sign, which is fine. However, it has to be with wet signatures. Um, and during the pandemic, that was actually very difficult for us to do. Um, there was also health and safety concerns. So we had somebody, you know, driving around from house to house uh, because we weren't in the office. So that, that was, you know, um, painful, I would say. Um, and you know, um, I don't know if it's necessary in this day and age of digital signatures. So I, I would um, I would highlight that as something I would love to see, you know, an upgrade in, in terms of, of how we sign documents. Uh, and then the other one is, I mean, you know, we're, we're having conversations and I know this has been brought up to the Bank of Lithuania, but there, there are incredible, I mean, it, it's taken the AML regulation to a very, very strict position, I would say. Um, and we are digital uh, first um, company, um, and there's still a lot of requirements uh, that include paper-based notaries, things like that, in order to prove who you are and what you do. 
which are, um, well, it basically are blockers for us to be able to grow our business, particularly well with small businesses. And I don't know if Dimitri and Sum Up have the same issue, but it's, it's, we're not a bank. So it, just to get a card is, is a, you know, we're a platform. So it's, it, it's a cumbersome. Yeah, I would definitely second that, Natalie. And from our side, we also have been discussing this um, already with Bank of Lithuania for a while. It's definitely compared to, uh, let's say, for UK, for example, there's a different uh, rule set, right, when it comes to um, what Natalie was mentioning about around the ML regulations. And this is definitely will be a big enabler for, for the business growth, right, from also from our perspective. But obviously, that comes with the flip side. I mean, there has been a lot of articles in the last years about the Baltic states in general and, you know, how the AML, the anti-money laundering regulations uh, have not been strong enough. Um, so obviously that's the flip side and perhaps it is a case of, you know, the pendulum swinging too much the other way. I mean, Marius, do you have any thoughts sure. on on anti-money laundering specifically and and is it something you are heavily focused on trying to work out how to ease that process without obviously easing it too much right probably i will not say any groundbreaking uh, you know thoughts here uh, we have differences uh, jurisdictional differences in, even across uk and and lithuania uk and eu just to point to a specific issue without talking about headlines you know driver's license was you know really a very contentious issue. Should you allow driver's license to be a document with, uh, to identify an individual? According to our national legislation, which I would say is stricter, no, because you know driver's license uh, uh, is a document which uh, you know you can obtain much easier. Uh, compared to other identification uh, instruments, be it digital or good old passport. But we work very closely with uh, our FIU and legislators uh, to find a workaround to ensure that other databases are being included in cross-checking, for example, the, the citizenship of individual, which is not always included on a, a driver's license, but it's mandatory to identify your, your client. So we found a solution, but it took time. So what we are doing, we are listening. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you know we're doing a survey. Every year, uh, we do a survey of uh, the legal industry, asking them, you know, how was the process? Uh, are there any things that you, know, you are stumbling upon which, is, which are really irritating? And Natalie brought those issues up. We know them. But it's not only us, you know, it's a, it's a much bigger community involved. And, you know, there are balances uh, to be maintained. The pendulum you mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes it swings one way, we try to push it back and we, we make sure it doesn't swing all the way to the other side because no one wants to create a loophole uh, where, you know, we have uh, all of a sudden uh, a big flow of uh, money coming from our friends in Russia into real estate in UK. So that's something we don't want to be part of. At the same time, you know, we want to be digital, uh, but digital is, uh, you know, it, it requires investments to be done not only in, in the scale up uh, level, but in, you know, in, at the governmental level and I don't have to tell you that you know governments are not fast moving. Uh, sometimes they are, but uh, usually startups are moving faster, and governments try to keep up, to keep up. And what we're doing, we're trying to keep up. And and obviously, you know, on paper, two hundred and thirty banking licenses, um, and you know, all these companies establishing a footprint in the country is both great for Lithuania and the the tech scene there, but also you know for for the companies, but. I'm wondering first to the the, the two scale up um, panelists. Um, what kind of operations have you actually established in Lithuania, and how are you envisioning the growth, physical growth of the company companies within the country? And and then to Madius afterwards, which is you know how is you know these companies that are not headquartered in Lithuania mostly that have most of their footprint outside the country, how are they really 
aiding the country or what positive aspects does that bring to the country even if they're not keeping most of their operations in the country well for curve so uh, we 50 percent of our customers and 30 percent of our our uh, billings are coming from europe right so it's very important part of our business and one that we want to grow. We've done, we, we ha, we're at that place without having done previously any marketing. Um, so, you know, no paid marketing was all done organically, which is amazing. Um, now we're starting to really focus on that and focus on actually acquiring customers through paid, paid uh, advertisement. So for us, it's a very, it's a very important hub. Um, and, you know, I think we, we went through the, the, um, the talent that we're, we're looking at. As I said, we have a founding team. Uh, we will be building out our compliance and AML staff as well to meet the requirements that we have within the, within the EEA. Um, and uh, we, we're looking at, you know, different areas. I, I, I think it's also a good time for me. I see a question in the, if, I, if you don't mind, Kit, uh, you know, about uh, what it is about um, yeah, please. what we found when we came to Lithuania. So as a scale up, and Dimitri will, will know this as well, you know, we do have a certain pace at which we go at. And it is different from what you might find at uh, more established companies. So we work pretty damn hard. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, the hours can be long and unpredictable based on what we're doing. And what we found is a workforce that is really willing to have that work ethic and that pace. Uh, we're also looking for people with an entrepreneurial spirit. And we've been finding that. So problems are coming up all the time. And we found solution oriented people. Now, I'm not saying you can't find it anywhere else. But, you know, we were very pleasantly surprised with, uh, with, with these, these different aspects. And then I'll just add one last part, which is very unique to Curve, not just uh, scale-ups, but we are a very direct company. Uh, so we say what's on our mind and don't worry for like hurting people's feelings. We don't have time. <laughs> we're just going to say what, what's happening and what we need. And I, I have found so far uh, with my founding team that that's okay. I can just say, I don't have to <laughs> explain that I, I just need to say something. And uh, we've been working together fantastic. It's just like, yo, okay, let's do this. Let's work towards this. And, and you just get on. So the directness I've, I've very much enjoyed. So and, and, Dimit I and Dimitri, I mean, how much, how many, what, what percentage of sum ups um, staff are in Lithuania? And how do you envision the local operations growing compared to the the whole company. Yeah, it's a good question. So, like when we start, maybe from the operational part of the business. So, some of the our countries that we uh, we run the business of the payments business within Europe um, are operated under our Lithuanian license, and hence we have to build that operational part of, of the business in there. Um, but also, um, as Marius also mentioned, through acquisition, we also acquired the very talented and the same fast moving um, and entrepreneurial team um, that are now it's part of sum up and also help us to build the, the stellar part of our product and technology right um, so it's kind of the now our team is around over 60 people um, in Lithuania and it's I think uh, if I compare this is growing pretty fast right um, in terms of the, the, the ratio um, if I compare this um, to the European offices role. So I think that's the trend that we want to keep up. As I said, I really hope that uh, we will find the enough talent pool, especially on the product and engineering side, that uh, can fuel our ambitions and the team grow. But so far, it's it's it looks good. So let's see. And obviously, Matt I'll, be I'll be competing with you for talent, Dimitri. <laughs> yeah, that's good. So we, we like competition, so it's good. It makes us better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, Marius, obviously you, you hope that every country brings every single employee into Lithuania. And, um, but, you know, when it comes to these companies that are utilizing Lithuania for, you know, the EU license and keeping their operations in the country pretty minimal, I mean, what does that really bring to the country? Does that still bring a lot that is beneficial to Lithuania? Uh let's have it you know not between the lines let's let's do an Italy style the intention is not to have limited operations but you can have a proposition let's say you know we would have an open conversation with curve 
at the beginning and we say, Natalie, if you consider Lithuania, 500 you know, jobs, otherwise it's a no. Thank you, see you next time. That's not the way you know, to approach a curve. You know, let, you know, let's ask Natalie. But what we believe is, this is, this is the framework. This is the way the, com the country works. Uh, the work ethics, all the other institutions, regulator. Do you, want, do you have a new product that you're willing to, to discuss? Let's have a discussion. Try, try finding that discussion in, uh, in other bigger jurisdiction and you know, the staff willing to talk to you. Because you know, we understand that's what we can do as an added service. And once that takes place, once the office is established, all of a sudden those uh, companies realize you know, that there is this other part of the ecosystem, which is you know, shared service centers of the global banks operating in Lithuania, uh, Western Union, uh, having you know, thousands of employees doing nothing else, just AML. Uh, Danske Bank uh, shared service office, which, you know, they are winding down, but all the staff trained in all the operations of, you know, hardcore banking services. And that's the pool which is feeding this industry and uh, allowing us to keep competitive, even with the competition between uh, Dmitry and Natalie, right? And I'm very happy that that competition is taking place. That competition leads into um, high added value jobs being created here because otherwise you cannot compete you know you cannot just uh, you know place in such a competitive market very operational jobs because you know you won't be able to attract people of that caliber so that's why i you know and now i'm speaking as a, as a citizen i'm very happy that uh, uh, these jobs that are in the high end uh, of uh, company is being placed here and it's not just the operational side which used to be 10 years ago so the business-minded aspect uh, the development of new instruments uh, okay we have today two companies with, which are focusing in payments but the future is capital markets uh, you know this is uh, the breeding ground for new instruments to be developed and uh, maybe the future is not uh, you know, having a number of EMI licenses, but the percentage of assets uh, being placed and managed uh, from this jurisdiction. So maybe that's the future. And just a follow up one for you, Marius, which is a question from Elliot. I mean, have there, was there any pushback from established financial institutions, you know, as Lithuania moved to become a more welcoming FinTech environment and, and really opened its doors to FinTech companies? Marius, any thoughts? <laughs> uh, I, pushback? Uh, well, I thought you would be asking the, the startups if, if they experienced any pushback. Uh, naturally, uh, we received um, uh, questions from the home industry asking, what about us? You know, you, what, what are you doing? You are opening up, you are creating the ecosystem which is open for foreign uh, companies to enter into Lithuania. But the answer was, look, what we are creating, we're creating an ecosystem which is pan-European. If you need help to go to Belgium uh, or back then uh, Britain, just let us know. You know, we'll give a call to FSA and you know, tell this is the company which is trying to enter the UK and you know, let's see what, what can be done. So that's the approach we have and uh, I think it worked, and uh, I believe that even domestic companies benefited because they also have been exposed to competitive pressure and uh, have been growing into better companies. Competition is always good, isn't it? <laughs> it's also bringing I, jobs. I'm a believer is, in competitive you markets, can't, and, uh, and you can't you can't deny it's bringing jobs. Like you just said, it's bringing some very really you know high end jobs into the, into the market. 
You know, protection and, lasts five years. After five years, whatever you have been protecting is redundant and you have nothing to protect. And looking um, to Dimitri and Natalie, I'm, I'm curious, did you consider other countries? And I mean, what lessons should other countries in Europe learn from Lithuania regarding its uh, regulations and regarding its openness to fintech companies? Yes, I, I did. We had um, a short list. We looked at many and we had a short list of uh, three. Could you share those, that and list, four, out of curiosity? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we had Ireland and uh, Netherlands, actually, that were on, on our list. Um, and um, uh, look, it, it, it really did come down to, <laughs> I mean, what, what did it for us was meeting the bowl meeting Invest Lithuania, multiple conversations with Invest Lithuania, uh, and then conversations with other fintechs that were already established there uh, who were giving good recommendations about their experience. So, you know, those are the softer things I think that you can't put on a spreadsheet. And yeah, Dimitri, if, I mean, what, I can... lessons, yeah, what lessons should other European countries learn from, you know, what Lithuania has so far done? So they started a while ago. They have, just like the UK, a concerted effort, a unified, well, I don't know how unified it is. I don't know the inner workings, but it, it, there's an approach <laughs> on how they're going to address this. And, you know, in, you know, we talk a lot about a flywheel effect and that's what's happening. Now, all of a sudden, you know, like I said, I went for recommendations. I wanted to know from other fintechs what their experience was and how it went. Um, so once you start doing that, you you know, um, it, it just starts to happen on its own. And now that there's this positive uh, outcome for the economy, we're all hiring there, we've, we've found a good workforce, you know, so it all becomes a very positive flywheel. Yeah, and I think maybe to, to add to that, what Marius was mentioning before, rather than just copying um, what let's say Lithuania or other countries have done, the other countries could also just look at what are the other blockers that stop, let's say, innovation or the fintechs to innovate, right? So this um, access to uh, clearing systems uh, solved through a central link is a good example, right? Kind of democratizing the, the field, the playing field for fintechs also to get access to financial systems. And for us, I think this was the maybe major um, factor also um, in our decision making. So, at, and I'm sure there are some other low hanging fruits elsewhere that other other countries can uncover to enable this innovation. I mean, I'm just curious, are we seeing any trends coming out of Lithuania that could really help, you know, the, a, a very forward thinking in the fintech space? I mean, obviously, uh, roughly 30% of fintechs operating or with a license in Lithuania are in payments. Um, what is it? 20% in financial software, 13% in lending. So, you know, there's a, a, a strong force of, of payment startups and scale ups in the country. Are we seeing some interesting consumer trends that are really coming out of the, you know, the, the melting pot of, of Lithuania with all these companies operating there? Can I give yeah, one? Please. Um, it's probably not only specific to Lithuania, but in general, you know, Eastern European uh, countries uh, is the part of the population participating in capital markets you know just not having a savings account but ac actually you know having a proportion of their savings invested in some financial instrument and that number has been always you know really low and what we have seen uh, with people embracing digital banking for the purpose of making person-to-person -person payments for the purpose of maybe just having, you know, once in a while some, you know, payment, all of a sudden being exposed to other services uh, of the digital wallets, which happen to be now providing brokerage service or access to trading of the stocks uh, in United States which may be or may not be available for uh, consumers through their bank, or they may be available, but not in a 
very e easily accessible form. And the outcome is strong growth of the population entering these financial markets. And again, me, for me as a macroeconomist, this is great. I don't want my population in Lithuania to be saving in only one type of an asset, which is real estate. That creates a lot of headache in terms of uh, macro, macroeconomic imbalances, but also diversification issues. So if, if that can be achieved, this is uh, a great social outcome, um, which has not been intended. And no one, no startup, you know, participating in payments, you know, or de developing a digital wallet is thinking about that. But the outcome is something that I'm happy about. Thank you. And, and just for our final few minutes, we are down to four minutes left of this talk. Um, I wanted really to ask each of you to give some advice. Um, from Marius, it would be for countries looking at trying to establish themselves as fintech. Any advice to the central banks there, to the authorities there? And from Dimitri and Natalie, it's for companies that are considering following you in setting up operations in Lithuania and having a license in Lithuania. Any advice that you've gathered from your, from your experience? So maybe let's start with uh, Dimitri. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'll try to come up with a generic advice because there could be different type of startups, right? Um, and I think from, from my perspective is um, to, to engage early on, right, um, with Bank of Lithuania, really to discuss the, the, the plans and the get, get the early feedback. I think my experience was really this kind of more, if I can say, lean, right? Where, you know, we have an early feedback and iterate and then move fast rather than like we submit something and it's a black box and we never know like who will and, and when will come back to us with the, with the results, right? So I think it's really engaging early on, talking, this, explaining the plans and getting the feedback, which then could give you a good... Um, Good sense of like this is the right environment for you or not. Right, and and Natalie, any thoughts to add to that? Having done the yes, I would. recently, I would say um, having had the recent experience for applying for the EMI license, it is incredibly involved. Have your documentation; it has to be very very thorough. The requirements are pretty strict, so you do have to have a lot of things organized. I would say this particularly for smaller startups. It's, it's, you know, it's quite involved what's needed. So make sure you are putting the time aside to, to have very, very thorough documentation and, and, you know, responding to everything that you need to in order to apply for that license and, and, and to have a, a smooth road. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure it wasn't our situation, but, you know, it, it probably might take longer. Um, but I, I know that the level that the, the bull is expecting and it's, it's, it's a very high level of of information required and as it should be. So be prepared for that. <laughs> and finally to you, Marius, uh, both any advice for startups who are thinking about coming, you know, setting up in Lithuania, but also for other regulatory bodies across Europe who are trying to, you know, emulate some of the successes you've had as, as you know, a developing a fintech hub. So probably I'll focus on the second part of your question, which is advice maybe thoughts about what can be done. Uh, I believe we are on the verge of another big change. Uh, that big change is, you know, before was embracement of technology. Now is we need to change the way the society is making decisions to make them push into a more sustainable way. And that will come at the practical level with a lot of reporting requirements for the financial firms even the ones sitting on this panel, maybe not immediately, but five years down the road. And that is a huge opportunity for other jurisdictions, including ours, of course, and we will not be sleeping, uh, who will be providing the most user-friendly system, uh, information system, databases, uh, uh, regimes, which would facilitate uh, this way of uh, reporting your sustainability metrics on, of your balance sheet portfolio or of the firms you are working with, uh, because that will be a, a big headache for everyone. 
uh, including firms uh, operating in financial market as well as non-financial firms utilizing services of the financial firms. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you all who have joined us today and especially thank you for our panelists, uh, Marius, Natalie and Dimitri for their, all of their great opinions and advice and thoughts. It's, these panels couldn't happen without obviously amazing talent like you guys. And also thank you to our partner, uh, Invest Lithuania for their support in this. Um, so we are now ending this talk, uh, please. Uh, and also thank you for your questions. Please join us at our next, next Sifted talk, which is on June the 9th, uh, which is also moderated by me. And that is on payments and open banking. So another, hopefully another very interesting discussion. Uh, thank you all. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you. <laughs>